Hi everybody, this is chapter 30. I hope you enjoyed chapter 29. It was short, but this one is quite long, so I might have to do it in two sections. Okay, chapter 30. I say goodnight to Mum and Dad and Joe at 11, but I don't go to sleep. I'm too busy planning my next spell. The spell that will bring Lily back. Last night I broke the cold snap and melted the snow. It's not Lily being back in her bed, but it's progress. The light traces of tracks appearing, cracks appearing on an eggshell before it hatches. This is the one that will pull her out. I'm sure of it. I try to refine my slapdash methods from last night, as she caused a spell last night, if you remember. This time I don't use random objects to represent earth, air, fire and water. I'm more thoughtful. I pocket small items from the house all evening. A box of fancy looking hotel room matches for fire, some decorative seashells for water, a quill pen from a museum gift shop for air. I fill a freezer bag full of thorning soil from the garden. I find a picture of me and Lily in mum's shoebox of endless unframed photos. We are eight and she is one on, she is on holidays, holidays with us but dirty blonde hair bleached white in the Spanish sun. We are eating ice cream out of a plastic penguin's head. You can use, you used to get those cups. I don't know whether you remember them, but you, we used them as lemonade cups afterwards. We kept them. At around two, I creep into the bathroom and repeat the bath, cauldron throwing rosemary, honey and bay leaf into the water. I'll have to buy more ingredients, proper ones, from the definition. This spell is from the book. It's called the Sailor's Loss. It involves taking two ropes of white silk and knotting them with a tailor's knot over and over again until you have one long plait. As you tie the knots, you are supposed to visualize finding a lost item bobbing in the middle of the fast ocean and then lassoing the lost thing and pulling it closer and closer to you. I make my spell circle, set up my shells, my matches, my feather, my earth. I'm getting good at this. I just feel a natural understanding of this stuff without having to try very hard. It comes to me like verbal conjunctions come to Joanne. Before I begin, I select a few tarot cards that I think represent what I want from the spell. I pick a card that most resembles Lily's character and decide on Page of Cups. A noble young guy who lives half in a dream world, I lay it my, it my face up in the middle of the spell circle and find two friends to join it. The Four of Wands for homecoming, the chariot for willpower, focus and mastery. I start to plait, focusing on the photograph of me and Lily the entire time. The silk is the cord from my dressing gown cut in half with kitchen scissors. I close my eyes and visualize. Lily is lying in the back, floating on the water. It feels like early dawn. A mist hovers over the river, piercing by an orange light in the corner of my vision. Her hair is in long mermaid strands around her. Her bug eyes are starting at the sky. I'm paddling towards her. I start looping the rope around my head like a cowboy. I focus in on the action, trying to correctly visualize what the rope would feel like if it were a proper lasso. 
how heavy it would be. In the river, I'm lassoing, but on the bathroom floor. I'm nodding, 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 staring at the photo, nodding and nodding and nodding again and again. Back in the bake, my arms are starting to ache and I'm growing weak. I'm too far away from her. A few times I throw the rope and it splashes next to her, flecks of water landing on my face. She doesn't move, doesn't blink. Come on, come on, I urge. Get the rope around her, get it around her. Why is this so hard? It's my imagination. After all, I can do whatever I want with it. I could get a dr drone to fly in and bring Lily right to me. But for some reason, I can't do it. I can't get the rope around her in a way that feels convincing or real. When I try to force it, my concentration just breaks and I'm too aware of myself too aware of being a 16-year-old girl on my parents' bathroom floor. I push through, just make the rope go around her. Maeve, it's not that hard, it's your, your funny brain. I do it. The rope loops around her ankle and pulls her in, but it doesn't feel real. The beck at dawn falls away and it's a cardboard scen scenery version of it. The more I pull, the more the reality disappears. A sound of a car alarm outside, a dog barking somewhere far away. It's gone. My concentration is broken and there's no room left for left to not. The candle is burned out. I know the spell hasn't worked before I even go to bed, but I can't figure out why. I try the silk knots around my wrist like a bracelet. Lily and I never went through a friendship bracelet face. Strangely enough, it seemed redundant. We were the only friends the other one had, so making a bracelet seemed beside the point. I wish I had given her one. I think she would have liked it. Before I drift off to sleep, I remember the definition. The shopkeeper again. You have to give big to get big. I flex my hand, looking at the delicate scar where the keys had cut into my palm. Of course, blood was sacrifice that turned an old shower gel bottle toiletries and a bathrobe of junk into real spell. I needed to figure out a way to give bigger. I feel awkward with Fiona in school the next day. Luckily Fiona is impervious to awkwardness so she doesn't realise the awkwardness or she doesn't care. She plonks herself at the edge of my desk and looks me right in the eye. Why didn't you text me yesterday? Because there was a power cut because of the heavy snow. You'll have to go back to chapter 28 or 29 to listen to that. That's when she did her first spell. Why didn't you text me yesterday? Uh, I tried to invite you over. Sorry, my phone was out of battery. Yeah, I thought that would be it. Uh, when, it when did it come back on? I don't know. Eight? But you didn't text me back. I thought the party would have been over by then. It was, but we still could have. She breaks off as if she is presuming too much about our friendship. After all, we have known each other uh, very, not very long. I thought that maybe, I say bashfully, you wouldn't want to talk to me. Why? Because of Rue? She scrounges her face. I mean, I know he's happy. Uh, he's not happy with you at the moment, but it is like a lover's tiff, right? Did he tell you what the tiff was about? He mentioned the lie. He says, screwing her face. She says, screwing her face to one side. But as I said to him, 
how were you to know? I mean, sure, in hindsight, maybe don't freak out at someone and wish them dead while the housekeeper is present? Grant it. We grant we know that now, but how on earth were we supposed to know about that then? I guess I say, the beginning of a smile on a face. I mean, imagine if I was held accountable every time I wished Joe's would disappear so I didn't have to babysit him. I would be in prison, Maeve. I laugh. She's right. Rue is entitled to hate me, but she's still right. Thanks, I say, laughing. I'm glad I have you on my side at least. You are my friend. I wasn't going to let him talk shit about you, but I wanted to make sure you were okay, because he seemed pretty depressed. Really? I say eagerly. Yeah, I mean, he was sound, like uh, s the same as he always is, but he didn't stay long. I kept waiting for you to text me back. We could sort it all out, but you didn't. I'm sorry, I said, or say lamely, and then I remember the spell. I grab her arm. I need to tell you something. Her face lightens up. Not here, though, I mutter. Art room? Lunch? She nods and rushes back to her seat as the class begins. At lunchtime, I tell her everything. Well, almost I tell her about the spell that broke the cold snap. The cogs that cut my, me in the river, that felt the failed spell last night. And so I think the issue is I finish practically f frothing at the mouth. I think I have to find a bigger sacrifice, like maybe a little bit of blood. I could reopen the old wound. Do you think that might help? Fiona looks at me blankly. You want to cut yourself? What? No, I don't want to cut myself. I just think, like the lady said, you need to give big to get big. You know what I mean. Sacrifice. <clears throat> Excuse me. It worked when I cut my hand in the river. She does her little thinking pose again, the prayer hands in front of her mouth. A little Hollywood namaste type gesture she obviously picked up from watching inside the actor's studio. She closes her eyes for a second. Maeve, I love you. Oh, okay, I replied, slightly startled by the response. I love you too. I love you and I'm telling you this because you are worrying me. This was not the response I was expecting. You don't believe me, do you? She busies herself with a piece of lint uh, on her sleeve, trying to avoid eye contact. Fie, I just think you might be putting two and two together and making five. What? What does that mean? The snow melting like it probably just melted on its own mave, but it didn't. Do you have any proof of that? asked Fiona, with a face like she's picking a scab off her a little too soon. I think for a moment, well no, <clears throat> I admit, but I know it was. I was in the circle and, and the water drops fell on your head. It sounds very cinema cinematic and everything, but cinematic it's just hard to believe i'm silent how could she think this after everything we've been through after everything else she's been willing to believe this is where the line line is i think if you were there you would understand i pleaded if you cast a spell with me you would know how it feels everything feels more real somehow i don't think i want to know how it feels it seems a bit deluded my eyes sting with hurt 
deluded, I don't understand. You believe the whole thing about the white lady, all that, but this is too far. The fact that there is real power out there and we can access it. Fiona bites her nails and looks uncomfortable. I'm sorry, I just don't believe that a 16 year old girl in her bathroom can control the weather, whether or not in X-Man. <coughs> I start packing up my lunch, throwing my uneaten banana back into my satchel and school or school bag. Maeve, don't. I can't sit with her right now. I love hanging out with Fiona, but I spent too long stuffing myself down to impress girls at St. Bernadette's. The longer I sit here and listen to her tell me that I am not capable of magic, real magic, the more I believe it and the less likely I'll never be able to do it again. The infamy of yesterday or the epiphany of yesterday, the sense that I could channel the bad parts of myself into good things is not something I can afford to let go of. Not when Lily feels so close. I just want to be alone, okay? I blurted out. It's not personal. It isn't. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, it is, but I'm not mad at you. You don't have to believe me, but I have to believe me. It's the only way I can find a way out of this. Okay, she says reluctantly. Friends, I say. Friends, she agrees. She smiles sweetly at me in confirmation. Just promise me you won't hurt yourself. I promise. And I leave. I leave the art room. I can't believe it. It's like something from a play. Exit Mauve. Or Maeve, sorry. The only time I've I ever leave a room is to storm out of it. But I laid a boundary with Fiona, a clear one, and even if it seems objectively crazy to do so, it feels like the right step. Uncomfortable but correct. After school, I head down to the definition shop to ask the shopkeeper about spell ingredients. Maeve? She's pleasantly surprised. How are you keeping? I'm okay, I smile back. I'm actually getting into spells a little bit. That's gas. In other words, that's wonderful. Well done, Maeve. Congratulations. Any good ones so far? Well, I think I venture this slowly. Not wanting to convince an other person that I'm insane. I think I might have helped uh, the end of the cold snap. Ah, now. Was that you? She smiles, her face wearily. Thanks be to God. I've been trying to work on that myself for about a week. Is that what you were doing the other day when we were last here? I thought I heard you chanting something under your breath. I was, she nods. I was working away on a few things, to be honest. Like what? Ah, it's all a bit complicated, but whenever there's a shift in energy, there's always a knock-on effect, you know? I remember Sylvia and how she talked about weights and counterweights in the magical world. Like a seesaw, I say. Exactly. <clears throat> Although I think of it more like Jenga or dominoes. It's all just games stuff knocking uh, other stuff out of the way or pushing it forward a bar fight between every known force in the universe all sliding around kill bag i can feel it in the air and how is that i try to look for the most magical word i know manifesting i guess she fixes her eyes on me considering her answer well on sensitives, Maeve Chambers, on sensitives. 
sensitives of people that are empathic, intuitive. So, wow. My face must look idiotic and confused because she starts laughing at my blank expression. Now tell me this isn't the first time you've heard that word. Sensitive, I repeat, like when your feelings get hurt easily. Is that what you mean? Not quite. Being a sensitive is a word we use to talk about people who, well, uh, let's say they are tuned into a slightly different frequency. They are a, on a higher plane. I stare at her mute. I'm not being very clear, am I? She starts again, slowly. A person who is sensitive might have a greater natural access to magic. They might come to spells or tarot easier. They might, I don't know. Find that certain magical skills like telepathy come to them naturally. I stop dead. My mouth is completely dry and I keep flapping it open and closed. I, I, uh, am, uh, I, uh, a sensitive? The shopkeeper smiles. Yes, Maeve Chambers, you are a sensitive. I knew from the first day you came in. Are there a lot of us? Hard to say. You are the first I've met in a long time, long, long time. And I tend to run in the kinds of circles where you meet more than average. Most never get to find out. They just spend their whole lives feeling a bit too bit big for their own skin. Are you, are you one? Me? No. Heaven was and that didn't go too well. I'm just an enthusiast, a good st study, a kitchen witch, she laughs, a village crone. <laughs> Heaven, her sister, she mentioned her before, I think. The first time I walked into the shop and she started on about having three E's in my name. But why me? How? She shrugs. Why brown eyes? Why birthmarks? Ancient an accident of fate, I suppose. And they and are they? We are we are this is one of those moments again. And are they? We are we powerful? The incense stick to her right burns down the long string of ash falling to the wooden slate. Beneath it, she takes a new one from a cardboard box, lighting it with a match. Hmm, do you smell that? She says, closing her eyes. Night blooming jessamine. It's very nice, I reply, still reeling from the new information. A sensitive, I'm a sensitive. I ponder it for a few seconds, inhaling the thick sweet scent that I will forever associate with this moment. In answer to your question, they can become extremely powerful. Not all great sensitives are witches, but all great witches are sensitives. And you, Maeve Chambers, she gazes at me, her bright blonde hair doing nothing to hide her steely grey eyes. You could be a very good witch. She turns to a selection of pale wooden drawers behind the till, opening and closing them to reveal that they are filled with freshly cut herbs. She smiles when she sees my surprised face. From the garden, she laughs. You should try growing your own herbs, so satisfying to make it all yourself. Thanks, I murmur, watching her move through the drawers with a tiny silver pail. Maybe I'll try that. She shoves little bits of ingredients into a leather pouch, moving between her fresh herbs and pots of spices that she pinches from. She quickly ties it closed with a drawstring. There were, there we are, pet, she says, 
placing it on the counter. Dandelion seeds, rosemary, aniseed and a pinch of chili for intensity help you focus your energy. Hang it over your bed for a full menstrual cycle. I must be blush blushing because she smiles at me. Oh, sweetheart, you mustn't be embarrassed. Our menses is a big part of our casting energy. You know, I stuff it in my pocket. Thanks, I say, still red. Any tips on how I can be a good sensitive? The only advice for being a good sensitive is not to be a bad one. What do you mean? A bad sensitive, she says, can see where people are at their weakest and they exploit them for it. They crowbar their way into people's hearts and minds, but all kinds of ideas in, in there and put all kinds of ideas in there. I immediately think of Aaron and how from the moment I first met him, I knew he could see the holes in people. We are alike in some way, both sensitives. Rue himself had said it on the bus home from the cob meeting. You guys are two sides of the same coin. Who's your sister? I asked. You said she's sen a sensitive too. What she says? I nod. I don't ask any follow-up question. This woman might feel like a friend, but she is, after all, just trying to run a business. I'm sorry about your sister. That will be three euro fifty, if you don't mind, pet. The air in the room has suddenly shifted, and I feel as though I should probably go. I pay her, thank her, and turn to leave. Then a brainwave. Do you remember the snow back in 1990? A silence. The shopkeeper starts cutting um, some sprigs of herbs, as though she hasn't heard me. The snow, I venture again. The only other time there was a snow in Kilbag and no other part of the country. More cutting, she opens the drawer and distills plants shards into them. She's trying to hide her face from me, but I can see her lips moving out, out, out. She's trying to cast me out of the shop. A wave of profound stubbornness comes over me. I clutch the silken bracelet made out of my dressing gown, cord and start whispering too. Help me, help me, help me. You told me what I am. Now help me. She shifts her eyes grey and mute and fixes her stare on me. The shopkeeper doesn't say a word, doesn't move a muscle. She slowly closes her eyes and as she does, mine start to close too. An image starts to form in my head, one of her by the river, standing next to me and watching a milk crate float downstream. No, not yet, she says, not yet. When? When? I'm sure you won't do something reckless with the information. I won't. You will. She's in my head. In the same way I can be in Ruth or he can be in mine. The only difference is that she is in complete control. She doesn't need the cards to form a gateway. She can do this at will. Just as I'm sure she's about to dismiss me, she says one last message. Sense it, sense it without even moving her lips. One more tip for being a good sensitive Maeve. Don't bite off more than you can chew. And then all of a sudden it's over. We are back in the shop. All four eyes open, the bell on the door rings and the woman starts asking about essential oils. Goodbye Maeve. 
the shopkeeper says, and I go. And that's the end of the chapter. Now we're going on to chapter 31. It's getting exciting. See you later.